Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, why the U.S. Justice Department is investigating Maricopa County's recent election problems. Also tonight, we'll look at a new law that makes for greater availability of venture capital. And today is Arizona Gives Day, a big day for local charities. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. House Republican leadership is refusing to bring up an adoption bill for a vote on the House floor. Representative Rebecca Rios is offering an amendment to protect the rights of same-sex couples who adopt children, but House leaders have blocked the bill in order to avoid debate on the issue. Rios' amendment is aimed at clearing up the issue of same-sex couple adoption following the legalization of same-sex marriage last year. U.S. Justice Department has notified the Maricopa County Recorder's Office that there will be a federal investigation of last month's troubled presidential preference election. Joining us now to talk about the investigation is Joe Canefield, former state elections director and partner at Ballard Spar. Good to see you again. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for being you. here. Were you surprised at the DOJ's decision to look into this? Not really. Uh, remember that Mayor Stanton had written a letter to the department uh, expressing concern about the election. Uh, and, and, and he specifically asked about whether or not there was issues with minority voting, and that's a red flag for the Department of Justice. So, so the mayor's letter uh, did have an impact? I think so. And I'm sure that there were others that wrote to the department as well, but that's what the department does. And this letter came from the head of the voting rights section for the entire Department of Justice, so this is serious. Yeah, and the Civil Rights Division looking at this, what exactly will the Civil Rights Division look at? They're going to be looking at whether or not there was a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, at least as best as I can tell from reviewing the letter. Uh, Section 2 says that any, any uh, voting practice or procedure that discriminates against minority voters uh, based on race, color, or, or language um, is going to be a violation of the law. And this is grounded in the 15th Amendment, which preserves the right to vote for minority members. So that's what they're looking at, to see if there was any kind of discrimination that, that inhibited or prevented minority voters from effectively casting their votes at the pr presidential preference election. Are we talking intentional discrimination, accidental discrimination, or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. It, it's The test is either intentional, of course, well, that will definitely be a violation, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be intentional. If the res as, as a result of the practice, the effect was discrimination, then that itself is a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And they, uh, there were a number of things mentioned in the letter that they wanted to ask. They want information regarding uh, just a couple of them here. Uh, procedures for determining polling places and the reasoning for reducing the number of those polling places. Why ask that? It's probably getting to purpose, just like you, you said. Um, they want to know if there, if what the reason was for reducing the polling places from the last presidential preference election. Uh, they want to make sure that it wasn't done intentionally in, an, in any kind of effort to discriminate or inhibit the ability of minority voters to vote. I don't think that's the case, but of course they want to do their due diligence and make sure. But remember, it doesn't matter, even if it wasn't intentional, if they find that the effect was the same, then there's a violation. Indeed, that's one of the great mysteries here. We've asked a number of people from Helen Purcell on down, uh, why why were these polling places selected out of the 60? And no one seems to have an answer. I mean, there's got to be some sort of, someone somewhere had a metrics, a, a table, a graph, or said, that one, that one, that one, don't you think? Yes, and, you know, I have to say, I've worked with the Maricopa County election officials, Helen Purcell, Karen Osborne, they're very good at this, and they take this very seriously. They've run dozens and dozens of elections. I'm certain that they made every effort to make sure that these polling places were appropriately placed. But I will say, though, I... Finding locations is, can be a challenging task. Not everyone wants to yes. lend their uh, facility out for voting. It creates parking issues, access issues. Uh, we've had those issues with schools and churches and other things. So I'm sure that even if they had a list of, of ideal voting locations or polling locations, they may not have been able to, to get every one that they wanted. Now, I know that the, uh, the Civil Rights Division was also looking at provisional ballots, and I guess that 80% of those provisional ballots wound up being invalid because there was not a registered party involved. If 80% of those provisionals were no good, that's something to look at. It's, yeah, I noticed that too, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the angle is there. It, unless 
they determined that the provisional ballots cast by minority voters, again, mm -hmm. uh, were disproportionately denied compared to non-minority voters. Uh, they're not just going to be looking at the general policy of Arizona with respect to how provisional ballots are processed. You know, they're really, the best I can tell, looking specifically at the impact on minority voters, and that's what they're going to be is it Is it minority voters? Because I know the mayor is also concerned with older folks, disabled mm -hmm. folks, other folks that may have been somehow compromised in their efforts to get the vote. There, and there may be issues there. Uh, and he did, the mayor, Stanton, did raise those questions about um, uh, what he, he also asked about um, provisional ballots um, and, and rejection. And then uh, was concerned about the, uh, the law that, that per prevents people from handling voted ballots. So, ballot so collecting, yes. ballot collecting things. So I, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure that those are specifically what the department's looking at in, in terms of their review. I mean, like I said, it, it's, it's to me, it's all, it, it, there could be federal issues with access and for the disabled and others um, and the elderly, but, and, and there's even, you know, questions about whether the polling places are adequately staffed with, with bilingual polling workers, I, and I that, that is in there, too. That is in the questions, right. too, yeah. But I, as best I can tell, again, I, I think this letter is focused specifically on Section 2. And keep in mind that the Department of Justice has been more active in pursuing potential Section 2 litigation following the, um, the Shelby County decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, which effectively uh, ended section, the Section 5 requirement, as you recall, before that decision, any voting practice uh, or policy in Arizona had to be pre-cleared or approved by the department before it could go into effect. That's no longer the case. So if that had been the, the case, then this polling design or this plan for the presidential preference selection would have had to have been pre-approved by the department. They didn't have the opportunity to do that. And they would have asked a lot of these same questions that they're asking now through that pre-clearance process. You, see, you, think that would, you think the pre-clearance process would have, would have kept a lot of this, uh, this trouble from happening? Well, I don't know. I mean, I know that they, that's, they certainly would have looked at where the, pre, the precincts um, or the polling places that were planned to be in the locations where there was a predominant number of minority voters. And they would have asked these questions whether there were sufficient right. polling places, bilingual workers, access, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and if they didn't think there was, then they would have, they would have denied pre-clearance or asked for a different. Last question on this. Uh, what will the Justice Department do with the information, and what's next? So what's next is uh, they're going to review whatever Maricopa County provides, along with any other information they gather through this, through this process. Um, if they determine that there's a violation, then usually how they pursue these uh, is, a, is, the, is a sue under, in federal court. Um, oftentimes these result in consent agreements, so there's a quick mm -hmm. settlement of sorts where the county would agree to uh, how they would to the, a process in the future for making sure these things don't happen. Or if they the county denies their claims, then it would be a full blown Section Two lawsuit that would make it all its way to final judgment. Oh my goodness! All right, uh, good information. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ted. A new bill signed into law purports to make it easier for venture capitalists to do to invest and do business in Arizona. Here to tell us more about the new law is Sarah Strunk, chair of the board of directors at uh, Fenimore Craig. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Uh, what exactly does this new law do? Well, it actually brings us in line with many other states in the country on uh, private equity and venture capital advisors. An investment advisor is typically regulated at both the federal and the state level unless there's an exemption. In many states, um, there are exemptions that are common among the states that allow certain private advisors to certain funds to be exempt. 
and we didn't have that in Arizona, and our laws were quite a bit out of date, so it really does update our laws. Uh, basically, what the, the, the old law was that these managers were licensed pretty much the same as stockbrokers? Pretty much. You, the old law in Arizona was that if you had a place of business in Arizona, even if you had no clients at all who were in Arizona, you were regulated. And there were, there were not common exemptions that you would see in other states. So it really was an impediment for many people who wanted to come to Arizona and open up a private equity fund or a venture capital fund and do business in Arizona because they weren't regulated in the same way or they didn't have the same exemptions they expected in other states. And if you were regulated here, you had to take a Series 65 exam, which is like a stockbroker's exam, get fingerprinted, be inspected, um, have your advertising and all sorts of things reviewed by the department. And the new law basically venture capital private equity funds exempt? It, does, it, it doesn't totally exempt them. You have to still register for the exemption and certain venture capital funds are exempt, but private equity funds, a private advisor to a mm -hmm. private equity fund still does have to register and pay a fee, but they don't have to go through all of the other onerous uh, requirements that someone regulated would. So if I'm a venture capitalist from Wyoming or something mm -hmm. and I move to Arizona and I want to do business, what kind of regulations are in place to make sure I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on the up and up? Well, again, if you're a venture capitalist, you're exempt. If you're in a private fund, a private uh, equity fund, which are a little bit different, you can um, then go to the department and register as a ex for the exemption, pay the $250 fee, and then file notices every year. And it's an annual thing to be exempt. How much difference will this really make? I think it'll make quite a bit of difference. I, I was at a private equity roundtable about a year ago and talking to a number of private equity uh, participants in the market here and a couple of us, um, particularly lawyers, were lamenting that our laws were out of date and instead of kind of admiring the problem and continuing to, to realize that that was the case, uh, we got together and decided that we really needed to do something about it and so David Farnsworth, Senator Farnsworth, who uh, is the chair of the Financial Institutions Committee, ask us to help him. And so we did, uh, starting last year, help him draft this exemption, which is modeled on a nationwide exemption that was drafted in 2011. So it does bring us up to date. But it, and I think for those who heard when I said uh, venture capitalists, if I came in from Wyoming or whatever, uh, there would be nothing as far as regulation. I mean, th that, that puts up a red flag. Shouldn't there be some sort of regulation? Well, there, the venture capital model isn't regulated on the federal level, and there are exemptions there, and most states follow through with that. So that is, that is the case with venture capital. It doesn't change the securities issues when they're raising funds, um, trying to collect money to to invest in companies. So the security laws are alive okay. and well, and the anti-fraud laws are alive and well. So fly-by-nighters beware. It's they're, they're, Absolutely. It's, you're still being watched. And, the, and this law does uh, still carry through what we call the bad boy exemptions, that if you've been convicted of fraud, if you've had any trouble with securities regulators in the past, then you may not qualify. You know, we talk about venture capital a lot on this program, and it's usually not a very uh, positive conversation. I think last year, two-tenths of a percent of national venture capital dollars went to Arizona. It, it just... What else can be done to attract seed money? It can't just be the licensing process and the regulation process. What's going on out there? Well, it is part of it. Um, it. It's part of it. Whenever a business wants to locate in a particular state, they want to know what the laws are, what the regulatory scheme is in that state. And if you are out of line with what national laws are generally, then that's a red flag, and they'll have to dig deeper. So coming in line with most of the states will help. We, I mean, we know anecdotally that we've had calls from, from funds in Chicago that have wanted to come to Arizona, and when they found out that they, we didn't have the similar uh, national, North American Securities Administration exemption that everybody else had, uh, they decided that they didn't want to come to Arizona. So we know that that will help. But part of it is just having that deal flow and having lots of things to invest in. And uh, we're hopeful that this will help bring some to Arizona and bring some out of the shadows. We're sure that there probably are some people who are operating as investment advisors that are probably not bothering to register. 
As far as this being an outdated law, laws are always put in place for a reason, regardless of when it was. Do we know why this law was enacted? You know, it's, it, it uh, predates um, the Dodd-Frank law by at least nine years, and it, uh, it coincides with Sarbanes-Oxley. So I really, it was, it was so out of date, I really don't know. Um, exactly why, and even at the time our exemption wasn't common or similar to other states. Most states allowed you to have the same exemption that the federal uh, government had, which is if you had 15 or fewer clients, you were exempt. We didn't even have that. We had a uh, provision that said if you have an office in the state and you have fewer than six clients, you were exempt. So I, I really don't know why we were so restrictive, and unusually so. Okay, so doesn't cost the state a thing, correct? Doesn't cost a thing. No tax credits involved, anything along those lines? Nothing along those lines. In fact, it hopefully will raise some revenue with people applying for an exemption, and for those that uh, that didn't, that should have, then they'll get more revenue. And it looks like it had bipartisan support in the legislature. It had overwhelming support, and that's thanks really to the staff at the Arizona Corporation Commission who worked with us to come up with a bill that they could support. And so Matt Newbert and Philip Hoffling over there and Commissioner Faris were very, very helpful in getting this move forward. All right. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining us. Thank you very us. much. from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at Arizona Gives Day, a statewide effort to focus on the needs and activities of charities and nonprofits. Joining us now is Lori Lyle, CEO of the Arizona Grant Makers Forum, and Kristen Merrifield, CEO of the Alliance of Arizona Nonprofits. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Uh, what is Arizona Gives Day? Give me a better definition. Arizona Gives Day is exactly what it sounds like it is. It's an online single day of giving where all Arizonans can participate. And the focus of the day, what, what, what is the mission here? The mission is to connect people with their passions and help them support their uh, nonprofit organizations and communities throughout the state. So basically raising money, raising awareness too, I would imagine. Absolutely. We have people that will go on to the Arizona Giving uh, website and find nonprofits that they had no idea existed and end up giving to multiple nonprofits, even though they went online just to find their favorite. So it's a great way to expose them to new donors. I was going to say, give me, give me a, a, a reason why this is, especially this day, is an yes. important event. Absolutely. Well, we want to always cultivate a culture of philanthropy here in Arizona. And for our nonprofits, the number one thing we hear at the Alliance is they need access to new sources of funding, new donors. And so by promoting a day of giving, we're exposing people who have never given to a nonprofit before. We see in our surveys, they've never given until Gives Day prompted them to. Interesting. Uh -huh. So I, I would imagine the big emphasis here is getting the word out, correct? Exactly. In a variety of ways. Right. And using social media is a huge part of Arizona Gives Day. And it's, so when it comes to individuals, what are you looking for? for? What, what, what do you want folks to do? How do you want them to react? Really want people to go to azgives.org, and they have until midnight tonight to do so, and find 
through keyword searches, look for causes that they care about. There's something on azgivesday.org uh, for everyone. So it's really a great opportunity for people to explore new opportunities to connect with organizations, as Kristen said, that they've never even heard of before. So it could be a health issue, it could be animals, sure. it could be anything. Children and youth. Yes. The environment. Mm -hmm. As far as businesses are concerned and their involvement in Arizona Gives Day, what are you looking for? Yeah, it's we've seen an increase in interest, especially from the local business community in supporting Gives Day. In fact, we have a list on azgives.org of local businesses who are either giving profits back to the nonprofits. Um, we went to Urban Cookies this morning, got some wonderful churro cupcakes, and they're giving 10% back to Tumbleweed Center. So there's a lot of local companies that are doing that. And even large corporations are getting their employees involved. I in was going to say, talk about big businesses yes. and how they're supporting the effort. Uh, one example, um, obviously First Bank is our sponsor and they do a wonderful job of getting their employees engaged. They wear shirts at their branches, but even Intel um, is encouraging their employees to do their giving through Arizona Gives Day. So it's a great way to get employee engagement involved, especially at some of our large corporations here in Arizona. As far as Arizona Gives Day, the history, how long has this been going on? How did it get started? Since 2013, so we're in our fourth year. And again, how did it get started? What was the thinking behind it? Who, who I was believe that it was the Alliance of Arizona Nonprofits, Kristen's organization, mm -hmm. and Arizona Grantmakers Forum, my organization, got together and decided that uh, Arizona should have a Gives Day too. Colorado and some other states mm -hmm. have had one, and so I think First Bank was involved mm -hmm. in the beginning as well. So it's a great tradition that we've started. I was going to say modeled after uh, other states? Yes, there's quite a few other states that have been doing it for a multitude of different years. Uh, First Bank is very involved in Colorado Gift Days, so when they came to Arizona, they wanted to, again, be a part of you know, having that culture of philanthropy here in Arizona, too, so they teamed up with us in Arizona Grant Makers Forum. And Thus was born Arizona Gift Day. And last year, 17,000 donors, $2.1 million, 573 nonprofit groups. Yes. Are you expecting more of this <laughs> going? I can let Kristen we talk do. about the number of nonprofits that have already been involved. We have uh, 960 nonprofits this year, uh, and we are nearing, I just checked it before I got on the air, we're nearing 1.9 million with six hours still to go in the day. So it's going to be a big year for us. As far as nonprofits in general, mm -hmm. how, how's it looking? How's it going out there? You know, it's really started to take an upward tick. I was talking to someone earlier about that giving overall and philanthropy is growing overall in the nation, but nonprofits have finally started to emerge from the, the recession. It took them a little bit longer because they saw a decrease in giving and an increase in need. So their kind of recession proof um, took a little bit longer for them to get out of it. What we are seeing them, them coming strong, they've been hiring. Uh, so it's a great sign for us. What are you seeing mm -hmm. out there as far as the, the state of nonprofits and charities in Arizona? Well, it's a vibrant nonprofit community. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're so pleased to be involved in Arizona Gives Day is that this day helps bolster our already strong and vibrant nonprofit community. But uh, the organization Kristen represents is a $22 um, billion dollar industry and uh, on par with the, the uh, retail sector in Arizona, 8% of the state GDP, so that's according to the recent report that came out. Mm -hmm. And so this is just one more way that we can all support the nonprofits that are making Arizona better. Mm -hmm. So Arizona Gives Day, let's go ahead and say it's a success. It was certainly yes. last year, looks like a success this year. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens to Arizona Gives Day tomorrow? Absolutely. Well, tomorrow we get to start announcing all the wonderful prizes that have been won. So our nonprofits will be excited to get our calls. But it really is meant to let's let's have Arizona Gifts Day be alive all year long. Mm -hmm. And so we're really focused on how can we creatively do that because now the next step for our nonprofits is, okay, we got fifty thousand dollars and we got five hundred new donors. Now what? So we're providing training to help them cultivate those relationships, help them follow up. So there's still work to be done to make those donors lifelong donors, lifelong fans, lifetime uh, volunteers for the organization too. And, and talk mm -hmm. more about the, the idea of training and keeping a day, uh, to turn it into a month, turn it into a year. <laughs> well, I think it's the beginning, as Kristen said, it's the beginning of a new relationship between nonprofits and these first time donors. Um, and so I think the training is for the nonprofits. But these are relationships that will start today and will continue throughout the year. 
so I think you can talk a little bit about the training that you provide to the nonprofits that sure. participate. We provide training even leading up to the day. How do I do a campaign? Some of these are smaller nonprofits that aren't used to maybe the social media trend that we're all getting a part of. So we provide training on how to get donors, how to set up your web page, how to use social right. media. So we really try to equip them to be most successful. All right. Very good. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for you joining so much. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Wednesday on Arizona Horizons, Senate President Andy Biggs will join us in studio, as he does each month of the legislative session, and we'll discuss the pros and cons of federal health care with the head of England's national health care system. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.